One intriguing statement regularly repeated is that we know more about outer space than we do our oceans. And while the accuracy of that fact could certainly be debated, it does highlight how absurdly little we know about water, which, by the way, covers 71% of the planet. It's estimated that as much as 95% of the world's oceans remain unexplored. Yes, we have mapped the entire ocean floor, but only to a resolution of five kilometers, meaning that anything smaller than five kilometers basically becomes invisible. The deepest part of our oceans is a section of the Mariana Trench known as the Challenger Deep, also known as that place where James Cameron went. It's located near the Pacific island of Guam. Here, the ocean floor plummets to a depth of 11,034 meters. That's about 36,000 feet, which is equal to almost 25 Empire State Buildings. Reaching it would be the oceanic equivalent of summiting Mount Everest. And in January 1960, two men and a bathyscaphe named Trieste set out to do just that. Let's begin with that word, bathyscaphe. A bathyscaphe is a self-propelled deep sea submersible. Think a submarine, but on a much, much smaller and more rudimentary scale. But there is one thing that it can do better. It can go very, very deep. For all of the linguists out there, the word bathyscaphe is composed of two ancient Greek words, bathys meaning deep and skaphos meaning vessel or ship. The bathyscaphe was invented by Auguste Picard, a physicist, inventor, and all-round old-fashioned explorer, the likes of which we just don't really get anymore. Much of his early work focused on helium balloons, and he became one of the first two people to ever reach the Earth's stratosphere in 1931. After 27 balloon flights, his final height record, and world record by the way, stood at 23,000 meters, which is about 75,000 feet, which incidentally is an astonishing 27 Burj Khalifa stacked on top of each other. How about that? But Picard wasn't just focused on the sky. Later, he turns his attention to our vast oceans and set about designing an object that would eventually carry his sun to unimaginable depths. Picard began building his first bathyscaphe in Belgium in 1937, but work was soon halted due to the outbreak of World War II. It wasn't until 1948 that FNRS-2 finally appeared. FNRS-1 had been one of Picard's final balloons. After achieving a then-world record of 4,000 meters, it was badly damaged on its way back to port and was eventually sold to the French Navy as funds could not be found to fix it. Parts of FNRS-2 were used for the expanded FNRS-3, which in 1953 broke the depth record again by reaching 4,050 meters in the Atlantic off the coast of Senegal. But it wasn't long before that record would be absolutely obliterated by the emergence of Picard's Trieste bathyscaphe. The Trieste takes its name from the Italian city in which it was built. Picard arrived in Trieste in 1953 to oversee the construction of his design, which incorporated scientific and navigational equipment sourced from Germany, Switzerland, and Italy. The design was similar to previous bathyscaphes, but considerably bigger. It consisted of a large central chamber known as the float, filled with petrol, which is significantly more buoyant than water and also much more resistant to compression. The presence of large amounts of petrol, 120,000 liters, meant that this chamber could be built using much more lightweight material when compared to the observation pod at the bottom where the crew would reside and which would need to endure incredible pressure as the bathyscaphe descended. The bottom of the ocean can experience pressure of 1,130 kilograms per square centimeter, that's 16,000 pounds per square inch, enough to crush a submarine like a tin can. While on the surface of the water, the Trieste's petrol tanks meant that it remained afloat and only began to submerge when the ballast tanks on either ends began to fill with water. To assist with the descent, the small craft also came with two additional ballast tanks called hoppers filled with iron pellets weighing a total of nine tons. When the Trieste wanted to surface, the hoppers were discarded with the help of magnets on the top of the craft. This meant that even in the case of a power failure, the Trieste could still surface. The cruise cabin, sometimes referred to as the Sphere, was purposefully overbuilt with the pressure demands in mind. The walls measured 9 centimeters, 3.5 inches in thickness, while the space itself measured just 2.16 meters that's about seven feet in diameter. The sphere came with a single small tapered glass window using acrylic glass as it was the only known clear material to be able to withstand such pressure. A central entrance tunnel led down from the roof of the bathyscaphe to the observation cabin at the bottom. Its propulsion came from battery-driven electric motors, giving out a rather sedate 90 kilowatt hours, which gave the bathyscaphe a mighty to horsepower. Oxygen was supplied to the sphere through compressed air with a long snorkel also attached to be used when the Trieste was still on the surface.
The Trieste spent its formative years off the sunny coast of the Mediterranean Sea. Its first dives occurred in 1953, close to Capri in Italy, and over the year, a total of seven dives took place, reaching a maximum depth of 3,150 meters. Things picked up a bit in 1956 and 1957, with as many as 36 dives, but the maximum dive limit remained roughly the same. While they were still some way off the depths of Challenger Deep, the scientific community and the world had begun to pay close attention. It was around this time that Uncle Sam came calling. In 1958, the US Navy made an offer of roughly a quarter million dollars, roughly $2.5 million today, for the Trieste, which was accepted. The bathyscaphe was transported to the Naval Electronics Laboratories facility in San Diego, California, where it underwent a series of extensive modifications with the goal of a truly record-breaking attempt in mind. These modifications included a larger gasoline float, larger ballast tubs, and a newly designed heavy pressure sphere, which was built by a company called Krupp in Germany, producing some of the best quality steel around, not to mention a sizable bulk of Hitler's artillery, tanks, and naval guns, by the way. The new sphere was constructed of three delicately machined sections, an equatorial ring and two hemispherical caps, and now weighed 13 tons while out of the water and 8 tons in it, while the walls now measured 12.7 centimeters in thickness. The American operation came to be known as Project Necton, which, apart from the main objective of reaching Challenger Deep, came with several scientific goals, including water current measurements, determining sound velocity at low depths, studying organisms, geological studies, of the trench and studying hull effects at significant depths. But let's not forget, this was the late 1950s. Competition between the USA and the USSR was hotting up. Cold War always producing amazing mega projects, and no doubt the glory of reaching the lowest point in the oceans was certainly on those countries' minds. But this needed to be a slow build up to the main event. The Trieste left San Diego on the 5th of October 1959 on board the freighter SS Santa Mariana, destined for Guam. Presumably, the ship was chosen for its name, otherwise, it would be quite a coincidence that the ship that set out to explore the Mariana Trench shared the same name. The first two dives took place within Guam's Apra Harbor, while the third reached a depth of 1,500 meters off the western coast of the island. Though these dives were all well above what would eventually be needed, it did allow the crew to test Trieste over the same kind of periods needed to reach Challenger Deep. On the 15th of November 1959, the Trieste set a new world record by reaching 5,530 meters. However, as it neared the surface of the ocean, once again, a loud bang startled everybody close by. The epoxy glue seals had burst as a result of the Trieste segments expanding as the pressure on it eased. Back on Guam, they found that small amounts of water had leaked between the sections of the Trieste. These seals were filled once again with epoxy glue with some added mechanical holding rings for good measure. The seventh dive of the Necton series broke the record yet yet again as the Trieste reached 7,300 meters in the Nero Deep area of the Mariana Trench. No doubt frustratingly for all involved, the Trieste couldn't quite reach the floor of this particular part of the trench which lay a further 15 meters below. This was due to damage to the gasoline release valve located on the top of the craft, which prevented negative buoyancy adjustment and forced the Trieste up. As astonishing as this achievement was, it also revealed the dangers of this kind of depth. Several implosion noises occurred on the Trieste as it neared its final depth, with a light inside the bathyscaphe exploding and a topside pipe used to support some of the scientific equipment collapsing under pressure. It was later found that this had occurred because no compensating holes had been drilled which would have relieved the pressure. The team arrived at their final dive site on the 20th of January 1960. USS Lewis, which had accompanied the Trieste, was tasked with pinpointing the exact location of the trench, measuring just 6.4 kilometers long and 1.6 kilometers wide. The fathometer on board was not designed to operate at such depth, so the US Navy reverted to good old-fashioned explosives. By dropping charges overboard, then timing the space between the explosion and its echo, the ship was eventually able to find Challenger Deep after 300 explosive charges. With the final location now found, the crews went about preparing the Trieste for what they hoped would be a truly groundbreaking dive. On January the 23rd, the Trieste positioned itself above the Challenger Deep and began to flood her ballast tanks. In the small sphere that day was Lieutenant Don Walsh of the US Navy and Jacques Picard, son of the man who had designed the Trieste and who had been acting as a supervisor on the expeditions. It's difficult to imagine that either man had experienced a more nerve-wracking four hours 
and 48 minutes that it took the Trieste to reach the lowest oceanic point on Earth. At a steady descent rate of 3.29 km an hour, the dive was remarkably free of incident until the window pane cracked as the Trieste passed 9,000 meters. If that doesn't send the heart racing, I do not know what will. No doubt there must have been a great deal of excitement of having reached the bottom of Challenger Deep, but the situation the bathyscaphe was in meant that the Trieste and its two members remained in considerable danger. They stayed on the ocean floor for just 20 minutes, apparently eating chocolate to keep their energy up as temperatures had dropped to just 7 degrees Celsius. As they stared out of the small, now cracked window, they saw what appeared to be a small sole flounder close to the Trieste. However, this claim was later questioned. Theoretically, the lowest possible depth that fish can survive is thought to be around 8,000 to 8,500 meters. Lower than that, and they would become hypersomatic, meaning that they would basically begin to shrink. They did also comment that the bottom of the Challenger Deep consisted of a form of microalgae. Unexpectedly, they also managed to communicate with the ship on the surface using a sonar hydrophone voice communication system. The messages took seven seconds to travel to the surface, meaning it was traveling at about 1.6 kilometers a second. After 20 minutes, the crew on board the Trieste released the hoppers, and slowly the vessel began to climb, a journey that would take them three hours and 15 minutes to reach the surface. The Everest of oceans had finally been conquered. The achievements of the crew and the Trieste cannot be overstated enough. This was a trailblazing expedition that almost doubled the previous world record set years before. In fact, in just 12 years, a series of bathyscaphes had revolutionized deep sea diving and effectively conquered depths that many had thought impossible for humans to survive. As the two men descended to the Challenger Deep that day, they not only gazed out at the depths for the first time, but re-established the limits of human possibility. And the fact that this was all done without the modern technology used on today's deep sea submersibles makes it all the more astonishing, this was an old-fashioned, swashbuckling scientific adventure at its very best. So I really hope you found that video interesting. If you did, smash that thumbs up button below. If you've got a suggestion for a future Mega Projects video, please do leave it in the comments below. I look at them and I tend to make them. So if you've got a great idea for me, leave it below. And thank you for watching.